or to forget your role in the community. Uh, I'm sorry that we are late today because uh, from yesterday, you know, it was suggested that we need half an hour for registration and because some people come for the first day to learn how to park or this and that, so we need this. But uh, for those who have been here, you know, even before 10, so I'm sorry, and please accept our apologies. There is a suggestion that Brother Amir later on will talk to you, but just to think about it, some people have asked that we should start every day at 10.30 because by the time they get here, you know, it would be difficult for them to be here at 10. So Brother Amir later on will handle this issue. So uh, if there is nothing urgent, so I start the discussion. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد ما شاء الله الله وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره وشيئته إن شاء الله This is our first session on self-building. And this is, as you've been told, indeed uh, following up for the course that we had before, about two years ago, on the same subject. You've been given a handout, which is uh, part of uh, what we have been working on to become, inshallah, as a book. And it's already also this section published in The Message of Thakalain, volume 10, number one. So that is also for your reference. Before I go into this uh, uh, handout, I want to draw your attention to something very important, at least in my view. You know, there are many, many people among all different religious and sometimes even non-religious groups who talk about spirituality. You know, it's not only we Muslims or we as you know, people of Abrahamic faith, you know, Christians and Jews that we talk about the spirituality. There are many people who talk about the spirituality. And you know, there are even people who talk about the spirituality without God. Something for us uh, very, very difficult to understand, let alone to accept. How can we be a spiritual without believing in God? What I want to say is, to make it very clear for us from the beginning, we need to know what are we after. For sure, we don't want just to talk about spirituality or to be you know, known as spiritual people. Just We are not pleased with the titles. Titles are not important. What is the core of spirituality in Islam? Some people think that we want to be a spiritual so that we can increase our, for example, you know, enjoyment of the life, for example, or we want to have peace of heart and tranquility, or we want to have extraordinary powers, we want to be a spiritual because we have heard and read uh, that there have been people who have been able to do miraculous things, extraordinary things. I want to be able to read the minds or to be able to talk about the future events. I want to be able to read and uh, interpret the dreams and this and that. 
And sometimes they don't speak it, but you know, deep in their mind, and maybe in my mind, maybe the reason for going after spirituality is this. I just want to be one of those great people that everyone loves and respects. <laughs> or sometimes, you know, people think that we want to be a spiritual because we want to make our spirit a stronger and a stronger so that our soul and spirit can be released from the control of material element which is our body and our uh, physical aspect and inshallah later on I will talk if I don't forget about a very important point made by Ayatollah Ansari. So there are different understandings but what we understand from the Quran and from the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ahlul Bayt Alayhim Salam is very clear. Although being a spiritual has lots of good outcomes and effects, but the only thing that we are really interested in or we should be interested in is to Please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to get closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else, if it's really good, if it is really needed for our progress, would come automatically. But it must not be my aim or my intention that... I do this for those things. Like for example, you know, if you go for Hajj, so your aim and intention is, inshallah, to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy with you, to have some time for reflection, for repentance, and many things like this. But naturally, also when you go to Hajj, you also make friends. Also, you enjoy yourself, you know, for example, you have also a holiday. Also, for example, you may have, you know, good, uh, for example, you know, foods or, you know, good hotel and this and that. But this must not be your intention, that I go to Hajj for holidays or I go to Hajj to make friends. Our intention must be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah himself has planned it in the way that it has lots of good outcomes. As Allah says in the Quran, nas. There are benefits for the people. Even I am sure Allah has made in his plan something for the welfare of the Muslim, for the trade, business. All these are planned by Allah so that had can be a source of income for millions of people. But this is not something that I should make my, you know, intention. So, in a spirituality, what we want to achieve is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just recently, I was reading a speech made by one of... Uh, living, you know, instructors of spirituality who is, alhamdulillah, living, as I said. And he made very subtle point, which I very much enjoyed. But in the beginning, it may be confusing. So please pay attention. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surat Zariyat, when he talks about, I think it's Zariyat if I'm not mistaken, when he talks about the creation of human beings and jinns, Allah says, "Ma khalaqtu al-jinna wal-ins illa liyabudun." You all know this ayah. "Ma uridu minhum min rizqin wa ma uridu an yutamun in Allah wa Razzaq dhu al-qubat al-mati." Allah says, "I have not created human beings nor jinns except 
to worship me. And you know that Allah doesn't need our worship. Our worship or failure to worship would not change anything for him. It's for our own benefit. But the point he made was very beautiful. He said, even our intention must not be worship. When we do something, we are not doing just because it is worship or I enjoy my worship. What is important is worshiping Allah because he wants this. You know, sometimes for us, just our worship becomes more important than Allah's will. Sometimes, you know, you see that people, for example, are told that you are ill. You should not fast. Allah doesn't like, you know, fasting when it's harmful to you. But we say, no, I must fast. So for whom are you fasting? Are you fasting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you are fasting to please and satisfy yourself? Or for example, I want to study, but at the same time, my wife or children are in need. So I say, no, I must study. And this study is important. But maybe at that time, Allah doesn't want my study, although it may be religious study or you know, some study for something good. But I must always be able to distinguish between what is really pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what are the things that maybe most of the time please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but not in that particular case. So a moment must always be alert. Don't do things as habits. Yes, normally, habitually, praying is good. Going for ziyara is good. Going for hajj is good. Reciting this ziyara is good. But sometimes, maybe something happens that that would be more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So... What we really want to do is to worship Allah for his own sake. Not to worship Allah because I am enjoying my worship. And whether it is pleasing to Allah or not, it's something else. You all know the story of Iblis. When he was worshiping Allah, for thousands of years, 6,000 years. And Imam Ali alayhi salam says, La yodra amin sinat dunya amil akhira wa abil akhira. And we don't know these years are worldly years, which is 365 you know, days and every day 24 hours, or the days of akhira. And you know, in Akhirah, every day is 1,000 years. So we don't know. Even if it is worldly year, 6,000 years is very long time. But what shaitan lacked was that he worshipped Allah 6,000 years, but he was not able to get out of this real servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Real sense of belonging to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was worshipping this ibadah. And when you worship and then you enjoy, you can continue for thousands of years. You need to be tested to see whether you are doing this for the sake of Allah or because you are enjoying yourself. So Allah had a test. You must prostrate before Adam. And this made shaitan very angry. I've been worshipping you for 6,000 years and now you have just created Adam from clay without doing anything for you and I have to worship for him, uh, to prostrate for him? Please exempt me from this. And whatever else you do, you say, I will do. If I, you want me to do thousands of sajda for you, I will do. If you want to, me to fast, if you want to, me, me to do anything, I will do. Just please exempt me from this. 
and according to some hadith, Allah told him, do you want me to ask you to worship me in the way that you prefer? What type of worship is this? Worship means complete and inclusive obedience. Worship is nothing other than obedience. When obedience becomes very mature and strong, then it's called uh, worship. How is it possible that you say, I want to worship you, but in the way that you like? You know, it's like, for example, you know, someone telling his father, I am very obedient to you. If you give me money, I am accepting. If you send me holidays, I will accept. If you buy for me, you know, most expensive cars, I will accept. I am very obedient to you. This is not obedience. Obedience can be tested when you are asked to do something that you don't like. And this is something that everyone must go through. It is true that later on you will, inshallah, enjoy your ibadah. You will enjoy obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in the beginning, it's always difficult. And this is why we call it taklif, obligation. Taklif in Arabic comes from kulfa. And kulfa means inconvenience, means trouble. Because in the beginning, we are not in that level of understanding that we enjoy about that. We think that it is a burden. But gradually, we realize that whatever Allah asks us to do is the most beautiful and the sweetest thing. Just I am not able to appreciate. Okay, so we are not after even worship in the sense of worship as such. Prayer as such. No, prayer for the sake of God. This is why every time you pray, although you are praying, but still you have to say, I am doing my prayer. Qurbatan ilallah. I want to seek proximity to Allah. So even prayer must be given life to it and spread by this niyyah, by this intention. Otherwise, without this intention, thousands of rakah of prayer is useless. They don't have any weight if they don't you know, get us even farther from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are to get closer to Allah and please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran very beautifully has explained this to us. The concept of pleasure, the concept of raza. We want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with us and if Allah is pleased with us for sure then we would be more pleased than anyone else in his life. The people who have achieved the pleasure of Allah then this would reflect in their own heart to be pleased. When Allah is pleased with you, then you are also pleased. Radiallahu anhum wa So if we want pleasure, if we want satisfaction, if we want a life without any pain and worry and fear, we have to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But again, I have to emphasize that our intention must not be this, that we want to be pleased. This should come by itself. But, you know, maybe for some people, you know, it's good to mention this because it motivates them. But for us, we really must aim at, inshallah, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the things that we have to do is to purify ourselves. The whole point in all the prophetic 
missions is to purify mankind. When I am polluted, when I am impure, when there are dirts in my heart or mind, how can I please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can I get close to Him? You know, if you want to go to a place which is very well looked after, very clean, and all, you know, hygienic, you know, measures are taken into account, they don't let you in unless you are completely clean and free from any pollution or any dirt or any germs. If we want to enter into the heaven, if we want to enter into the close circle of the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to occupy in our heart, so how can this happen when I am polluted and I am dirty? So the whole point is to purify ourselves and to get rid of all these impure things. If you could reflect on some of these verses that I'm going to recite, I think you would agree with me about the same point that I made. For those who have handout, you know, if you look at page 60, please. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in three verses of the Quran directly talks about the mission of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says that one of his major tasks was to purify people. For example, in verse 2 of chapter 62, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is Surah Juma. Allah is the one who has sent amongst Ummiyin. Ummiyin have been interpreted in different ways. One of them is illiterate people, but Another interpretation is that Ummi is someone who comes from Mecca because Mecca is Ummul Qura. So Ummi is someone who comes from Mecca. But uh, it doesn't change you know, the point that we are going to make. Anyway, the one who has sent amongst Ummiyin Rasulan, an apostle, a messenger, from among themselves. This is very important. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends someone as apostle, he sends from the same people and with the same language. This is very important. So Allah doesn't send a stranger, a person that people have no idea about him, about his past, about his history. Allah sends someone that they know for a long time. They know his history. They know how reliable and trustworthy and honest he is and has always been like this. And they know that he belongs to a good family so that there is no excuse left. You know, if someone, a stranger comes, people say, you know, we need in to investigate this person. You know, maybe this person is not trustworthy. It's not like us that, you know, whoever comes, you easily, you know, believe in him. So, Allah says, from among themselves. Okay. Now, from this part, Allah talks about the tasks and mission of the Prophet. One is to recite to the people his verses or his communications. So, for sure, one of the major tasks of the Prophet was recitation and 
reading after Quranic verses. This is very important. But in addition to that, it was not just that the Prophet was reading the Quran and reciting the Quran. In addition to that, the Prophet was yuzakihim, was purifying people. And inshallah, I will later on reflect on the concept of zakat and tazkiyah. وَيُعَلَّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And teach them the book and wisdom. وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ظَلَالٍ مُبِينَ Although they were in manifest error before that. The same idea is repeated in the following verse from chapter Ali Imran, chapter 3, number 164. Is the same. Lagad manalla ala al mu'minin, is baasa fi him rasulan min anfusahim, yet lu alayhim ayate, wayozaki him, wayo alemuhumul ketaba al hikmah. The same three tasks to teach people how to know the Quran and how to recite the Quran, how to memorize the Quran, whatever to make them familiar with the linguistic aspect of the Quran. This is recitation. But, وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Purification. وَيُعَلَّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ بَالْحِكْمَةِ And teach them the book and wisdom. So three tasks are the same. And again, in chapter 2, Surah Baqarah number 151, كَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا فِيكُمْ رَسُولًا مِنْكُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِنَا وَيُزَكِّيكُمْ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ So, this cannot be an accident that in three verses of the Qur'an, Allah mentions three tasks for the Prophet. Tilawah, recitation, and recitation of the Prophet was different from our recitation. We recite, but even if we don't recite, people are, can recite themselves. But recitation of the Prophet was introduction of the Quranic verses to the people. So it was to make them familiar with the Quran. But also purification and teaching the book. So this is important that the Prophet was also responsible for teaching the Qur'an. And this is what we followers of Ahlul Bayt put emphasize on. We say that Qur'an is always in need of a teacher. It is true that when the Prophet passed away, we had the Qur'an. And we are not in need of you know, new revelation to come. We are not in need of someone to recite Qur'an for us. That is all done and looked after by the Prophet But we are still in need of a teacher. The Prophet didn't only recite the Quran. The Prophet also taught people the Quran. And this teaching of the Quran and wisdom come together. And I think one of the ways to understand and test whether your understanding of the Qur'an is sound or not, is to see how wise you are. Are you wise in your personal and social life? Can you make good interaction with people and at the same time in the long term make sure that you meet your aims and objectives? This is a very important challenge. Anyway, the Prophet, in addition to reciting the Qur'an, was teaching the Qur'an, teaching the book, and I don't have time to talk that maybe just give you some idea to reflect later on yourself, you know, can maybe follow it up. Al-Kitab may not necessarily be just Qur'an. Al-Kitab can be something more inclusive than the Qur'an. Al-Kitab can be indeed the source of the Qur'an. Because, you know, 
قرآن تورات انجیل these are all manifestations of Allah's knowledge of course the most complete manifestation is Quran but they all are manifestation of something else which that is also called book إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ Surely Quran is a noble book but where does this Quran come from? فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٍ The Quran by itself is in a hidden book. لا يمسه إلا المتحرون And only the people who are purified have ability to touch and have access to that hidden book. Okay? And this is why, in my view, this is why we call the Christians, Jews, and Zoroastrians Ahlul Kitab. We don't call them Ahlul Kutub. We say Ahlul Kitab means they all believe in manifestation of or instances or cases of the same source that to whom the Quran also belongs, and that is Al Kitab. Or, for example, you know, in the case of the Prophet Sulaiman, Allah Nabi Nawa Ali Wa Alayhi Salam. You know, when the Prophet Sulaiman asked, who is able to bring the throne of the Queen of Saba here? So first, one of the jinns said, I can bring it before you stand up or before you finish this session, because there are two interpretations. But Allah says, But the one who had some knowledge of the book, what does the book mean here? Does it mean something like Torah or means the book which is the source for this? Means someone who had some access to divine knowledge. Anyway, the Prophet was able to teach the Quran and the wisdom, but but not right after recitation but rather after purification of the people for the prophet to be able to teach people the book and wisdom it was necessary first to purify people it is not accidental that in all three cases Yuzakihim comes before you Allemuhum. Interestingly, Quran says that it was indeed a request, a prayer of the Prophet Ibrahim, and of course with Ismail, that he asked such a prophet and such an apostle to come. But please look at the difference between the way the Prophet Ibrahim and Ismail prayed. And the way Allah answered, if you look at the verse 127 up to 129 from Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the fact that Ibrahim, with the help of Ismail, were raising the walls of Kaaba. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ يرفع إبراهيم القواعد من البيت وإسماعيل when Ibrahim was raising the foundations means there were already foundations from the time of Prophet Adam but the walls were ruined so on the same foundations Ibrahim was erecting the Kaaba, with the help of Ismail. Then they made this dua. Rabbana taqabbal minna, innaka anta sami'ul alim. O Allah, please accept from us. You are surely the hearing and the knowing. This dua by itself is very important. 
Look at Ibrahim. He is a beloved servant of Allah. He is one of the great prophets. With the help of Ismail, and you know Ismail is Zabihullah, the one who was ready to be sacrificed. And Allah redeemed that with sending you know, a sheep. These two great personalities are making Kaaba the house of Allah. And this is after the command of Allah himself. So two great prophets are doing something that for sure Allah is pleased with. But still they are worried. Is Allah going to accept or not? Not because they are not sure about this being good. Because they are not sure about themselves. This is, you know, human nature. As long as we are in this dunya, we can never be sure about ourselves. We can never be, you know, 100% guaranteed that my intentions are pure. So this, I think, leaves no space for any person to say that I am 100% sure that Allah would accept what I am doing. We must always pray. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh Allah, please accept from us. Waj'alna muslimayn lak. Oh Allah, please make us two submissive servants of you. We want to be Muslim. Muslim means submissive. Ibrahim is still asking for this because submission to Allah is not fixed at any level or degree. He was already submissive to Allah, but he wanted to be even more submissive to Allah. وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتَنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكْ and we just don't want it for ourselves. We also want it for our progeny. One of the things that is very interesting for me when I read about Prophet Ibrahim in the Quran is that Ibrahim is very much concerned about his zuriya, about his progeny. This has one natural reason, but I think it's much more than that. The natural reason, maybe someone say, because Ibrahim for a long time didn't have any child. And when he was old, you know, through a miracle and a gift of Allah, he, then he had Ismail and then he had Ishaq. So a person asking for a child for tens of years, then being a child or children, he must be very attached to his children. So this is why he always, you know, is talking in the Quran about his zurriya. Even when Allah told him that I'm going to appoint you as Imam and need ja'iluka linnas imama, he said, Qala min Are you going to continue this? Am I my progeny? Or when he wanted to leave Ismail and Hajar next to uh, Kaaba, again said, Rabbana inni askantu. And I am leaving my you know, family, my uh, child here, my wife, in a place which is a desert. So this is one explanation, but I think it was not just that. Maybe this has something to do with uh, this, but I think this is something that everyone must be like that. Even you know, if you have been given a child you know, when you were very young, Still, we must know that as parents, we have always to be concerned about our children. If there is anything good that we want it for ourselves, we want, should want it for our children. Of course, for the, also the rest of the people, but you know, we must be very much concerned and worried about our children. And if is there is any danger, anything worrying, we must always be worried also about our children. So I think this is a lesson that we can learn 
from Ibrahim alayhi salam. So they said, وَجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنَ لَكْ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتَنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكْ Also we want this for our progeny. وَأَرْنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا Oh Allah, please show us. Please show us how can we perform our rituals in the way that you accept and you are pleased with. وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا Please return to us. Please accept our repentance. And then, رَبَّنَا وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ How wise was Ibrahim and Ismail? They were, both were very wise. And they made such a beautiful dua. After he asked about his zurriyah, and you know that the Prophet وسلم, is connected to Ibrahim through Ismail. And the Prophet Musa and the Prophet Isa are connected to Ibrahim through Ishaq. So, the Prophet Ibrahim and Ismail both prayed this. So, this can be answered in the progeny of Ismail. Because this was the dua of both of them. You know what I mean? If it was just Ibrahim, it could be answered in both lineage. So, they said, وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ Oh Allah, please raise among them, please appoint among them an apostle from themselves. Oh Allah, please raise among them an apostle from themselves who would recite for them your verses and teach them the book and wisdom and purifies them. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Surely you are the mighty and the wise. Okay. This dua was answered. And the answer was, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah wanted to answer the dua of Ibrahim and Ismail by sending the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And everything is like what they wanted. To send an apostle, men whom, from themselves. Ismail didn't want his zurriya to follow a, an apostle who comes from outside. He wanted the apostle to be one of them. Would teach them the verses of the Quran, teach them the book and wisdom and purifies them. But the only thing which is different is that Allah said, my prophet is going to give priority to purifying people than teaching them the book and wisdom. You said, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ But in all those three verses that we recited, Allah says first, يُعَلِّمُهُمْ or يُزَكِّيهِمْ Which one is first? يُزَكِّيهِمْ is first. Because as we said, to purify people is more important and also prepares the ground for teaching the book and wisdom. So this concept of tazkiyah is very important. And this is the core in Islamic spirituality. This is why our ulama throughout the centuries have written lots of books and essays and have talked about tazkiyatun nafs. We want to purify ourselves. If we purify ourselves, then we would be the nearest to Allah who is the most pure. One of the things that make us very much impure is forgetfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us dark 
And sometimes if it continues, it makes us impure. It makes us polluted. And inshallah, this would be the core of our course, inshallah. We would, inshallah, talk in details about the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which I believe to be the main solution, if not the only solution, for all our problems. And inshallah, when we talk about it, I think you will agree with me that remembrance of Allah is the core, is the essence. Just remember, you know, what you recite in Dua Kumail. Ya man ismuhu dawa wa dhikruhu shifa. Oh, the one whose name is medicine and whose remembrance is healing. So if Allah's remembrance is healing, so his forgetfulness is the illness. So inshallah, we will talk about this concept of remembrance of Allah and how that brings light and how that is connected to contemplation, how that is connected to supplication, how that is connected to glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, I hope we would be in a better position, inshallah, to appreciate uh, this gift of remembrance of Allah, inshallah. So that is a very important thing. But on the other hand, there are certain things that stops us from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not accidental that we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not accidental that when I am praying to Allah, even during my prayer, I am not mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, sometimes you know, people ask, how can we have presence of heart when we say our prayer to Allah? And of course, I don't have any secrets for this, and I am, you know, myself, you know, looking for answers for this. There are certain things that, you know, we know, and, you know, one can benefit from. But I think it's impossible for a person that throughout the day forgets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then all of a sudden, when he sits on his sajada, he wants to have presence of heart and remembers Allah. If there is any way to do this, you know, I would be very grateful to learn. I think if you want the presence of heart when you pray, you have to make sure that throughout the day, you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, if you achieve this remembrance of Allah throughout the day, then in the prayer time, that would be the peak. And if there were moments or you know, minutes that you were forgetful, that would not stop you from remembrance of Allah when you are praying. But if 90%, 95% of the day, we forget Allah, how can all of a sudden you know, we change and then we concentrate on Him? This is my understanding. I hope I am wrong. But to best of my knowledge, this is the case. So we need to learn how to get rid of the barriers and obstacles for remembrance of Allah. One of the things which is, again, the most important thing, because you know we have always to be able to stress on priorities and the most important things. Remembrance of Allah is the most important thing in the positive side. And the most important barrier and obstacle is hubbud dunya, is the attachment to the worldly life. Dunya, of course, you know, this world is not dunya. This world is nature. This is good. This is a gift of Allah. This is a blessing of Allah and a sign of Allah. And it's holy and sacred. From Islamic point of view, this world is sacred. Because it's created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we call hubbud dunya is the, not the love for nature or the love for animals or the love for money or the love for water or the love for even money as such. These are as such all good. 
but attachment and excessive love to the extent that instead of you benefiting from them, you start worshipping them. And instead of possessing them, you are possessed by them. This is wrong. This is dunya. And we have this hadith from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have it on page 62. dunya ra'su kulli khati'ah. And some people read it, dinar And both is correct. It means the love for money is the foundation of every mistake, or the love for dunya is the head of every mistake. But the famous reading is dunya It's very powerful a statement. The root, the origin of every mistake that we make is our excessive love for dunya, for material life. Because when you are, you know, obsessed and uh, when you are very much, you know, in love with something, and this love is not result of understanding. You know, it's not like love for Allah. Love for Allah, because it comes after understanding, it doesn't make us blind. Indeed, it makes, makes us, you know, even sharper in our understanding. But if love comes before understanding, and it is just emotional love, then it makes us blind. And we are not able to understand. And then what do you expect from someone who is blind and cannot see anything? So if there is something, you know, in front of him, he would not be able to avoid. He would hit. So, Then there is a beautiful argument in end of this hadith. And normally, unfortunately, this part is not quoted. The Prophet says, Do you know why this is the main mistake? This is the principal mistake. Because the one who has this love for dunya is loving something that in the sight of Allah is the least significant thing. Dunya in the sight of Allah is the least important thing. You know, we have hadith about this. That if dunya was important for Allah, Allah would not have given dunya to the bad people. Dunya is so useless and so valueless in the sight of Allah that he is more keen to give dunya to his enemies. Or if, you know, the people who don't believe in Allah, they do something good, Allah gives them dunya to please them or as a reward. Or if you, for example, you know, you mu'mineen, if you pray for something worldly, the chance of getting that is much more than praying for something spiritual. If you want something spiritual, you must pray more and more and more. If you want just a car or a house or good business, it's much easier. Why? Because dunya is the least significant thing in the sight of Allah. Okay. The grave mistake is to make dunya, which is the least significant thing in reality, the most important thing in our understanding. When I give priority to dunya, it means that I have failed in understanding the whole point in the creation of this dunya. And indeed, this by itself is a sinful style and manner in the life that Allah says, dunya is not important for you. I say, no, dunya is the only thing which is important for me. This is by itself a crime. And this is very much stopping us from getting closer to Allah. To solve this problem, something that all the prophets have asked people is to give alms, to give zakat. Why I say all the prophets, because this is not only in Islam. Even, you know, Prophet 
Isa, Jesus, peace be with him. When he was still you know, a newborn baby, one of the things he said was, Ausani besalate was zakata ma dum to hayya. Allah has asked me to pray and to give alms as long as I am alive. To give alms, whatever people call it, maybe they don't call it you know, zakat, they call it in their own languages. To give alms or zakat is to help us in purifying ourselves. Why is it called zakat? It, did, it is coming from the same root, zakawa, from which tazkiyah comes, purification. Some people have said, you have details in the handout so you can read it yourself later, but some people say the reason it is called zakat, it's because it purifies your money. When you give part of your money for good causes, then the rest of the money would be purified and would be more blessed. Some people say it comes from zakawa meaning growth. When you give zakat and alms, your money grows. So instead of having less money, you will have more money. So if you have, you know, sh shortage of money, so you can give zakat and then you will have more. But I believe that this is all tr these are all true, but the main reason for zakat being called zakat is that it helps you in purifying yourself, not purifying your money. Of course, money is purified, but the most important thing is your heart to be purified because money as such is not pure or dirty. You know, money, the notes are not pure or dirty. It's my belonging to the money which can be pure or impure. Zakat is to purify the person who is giving. And you know, once uh, in Darul Salaam, I was asked to give a talk in Kebaha for Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So I was asked to talk for the people, you know, who have been helping and donating money to Vipas. It was the 20th anniversary of it. So when I was preparing the lecture, then these verses drew my attention. That from a Quranic perspective, indeed the main beneficiary is the giver, not the receiver. When I donate some money, more than what those people receive, I receive. Why? Because I am purifying myself. It's not only a matter of receiving reward. Of course, reward is there. There is great reward. But it's not only reward. It's the actual effect that it has on your heart and on your reality. And this is the Quran. Allah tells the Prophet, if you look at page 64, Take from their possessions sadaqa. Sadaqa means charity. Why? Take from their money charity. Why? To pure them, purify them, and clean them. It's not that the money is going to be purified. The people are going to be purified. So when the prophet was receiving money from people, more than what the poor people were receiving, the same people were receiving. And this is the miraculous power of giving money for the sake of Allah. Because by giving money, you are reducing your love for money. And Allah, as a reward, makes your heart purer and purer. And there are other verses that, inshallah, you can read yourself. So, 
Inshallah, what we are going to continue is on the constructive aspect of it, on what we have to do to purify ourselves. But sometimes, you know, we need to also to refer to the obstacles and barriers because they, they are also very important. But uh, because we would have limited, you know, sessions, so I will try more to focus on the constructive aspect. And inshallah, uh, with the help and guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and inshallah with your du'as, I hope, inshallah, we would have fruitful discussions. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَ أَنَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ So now if we could, uh, those who are not in hurry, if you know, we could divide into groups of five, six people, each group, and then have you know, some discussion, maybe 20 minutes, then we come back and inshallah we would continue the discussion. And I hope by the time, by now, the tea is also ready. It's ready, yeah. So you can take a cup of tea and coffee. And also, Brother Amir, do you want to clarify the issue about timing? Is everyone happy? Yes, uh, the, the issue was if you have prior rain or not, obviously. And, and yeah, all the time frame would be shifted to 12 30, right? Uh, yes. Still two hours, right? Yes. The lecture is one hour, so if you are in Harry, you can leave. But uh, we continue with the group discussion and then final remarks, inshallah. So they have